Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to see so many people at our 2014 Hurricane Seminar. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Kim Monette. I'm the Life Skill Trainer here at Cherry Point. I work with the Family Team Building Department. So uh, there's lots of good programs our department runs. If you have any questions after this brief, you can talk more to me. But I know who you are here to hear um, about today. It's from our wonderful panel of speakers. I'll introduce them shortly. But thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules today to be here. I know it's not easy um, getting out of the office sometimes, but we know hurricane preparedness is important, so thank you for being here today. Before we get started, did everybody get a chance to sign in and grab a door prize ticket? Keep, the, keep those door prize tickets handy. The Marine Corps uh, Exchange has provided some awesome door prizes today, so keep those tickets handy. So we have a wonderful seminar plan for you today. This event is a collaboration of several organizations, um, it's installation resources, MCCS resources, community resources that have gathered here today to share some pretty important hurricane and severe weather preparedness information with you today. We want to keep you and your family safe this hurricane season. Has anybody been through a hurricane before? Okay, handful of you guys, okay. But um, if you haven't, um, or even if you have, hopefully you'll take something away today um, that is just a good reminder of all the things we need to be doing now to make our plans for, you know, what if that storm comes this summer, okay? So it's important to have a plan. So before we get started, I'd like to thank our wonderful panel of guest speakers who will share their information with you today, up front here. Um, we have Mr. John Cole from the uh, National Weather Service and with NOAA. We have retired Marine Major James Jarvis, who is a key volunteer with the American Red Cross. Mr. Mike McGinnis is a family ready readiness officer. Sergeant Urban is with METOC. Ms. Etta Lucas is the installation emergency manager here at Cherry Point. And finally, Captain Palmer with Legal Services Support Team. Okay, thank you all for taking time out of your busy jobs today to join us as well. I would also like to take some time to recognize the wonderful folks you see at the resource tables around the room today. We have lots of good information and resources for you. They've brought a lot of things for you. Um, so please take some time at the conclusion of this brief to visit with these resource tables. Um, we have DECA, the wonderful ladies from the commissary here with some food preparedness items. We have our Marine Corps Exchange in this far corner. They have preparedness merchandise that you can actually buy today on the spot and take home with you today. So they have their point of, serve, uh, point of sale system with them today, so you can buy some supplies. We have AMCC, Atlantic Marine Corps Communities, in the back corner. She has lots of good information for those of you who are um, residents on base. We have our Joint Public Affairs Office, who will be in the back corner. They have the brand new 2014 Destructive Weather Guides and they'll also be taking some wonderful pictures. Combat Camera is here today um, doing some videotapes as well. And thank you, Public Affairs, also for helping to advertise this wonderful event. Um, the American Red Cross, he has his table um, in that corner. Wonderful kits, readiness kits on display, readiness items. Our installation emergency manager and John Cole with the National Weather Service and NOAA will be in this corner. And John brought his wonderful tornado machine today. So if you want to check out what a, a mini tornado looks like, make sure you stop by that table today. He has a, a pretty cool tornado machine to show you. So. I have one last thing to share um, before we hear from our panel. We want to keep this seminar interactive today. Um, we want to make sure all your questions are answered, but we're going to hold questions for the end of the seminar to allow each of our speakers to have plenty of time to share their information. At that time, at the end of the seminar, we'll open up the floor to a Q&A session, so be thinking of your questions. If you just can't wait to ask your question, I want you to use our text a question tool. You can see the information in this corner here. I know you, I know you have smartphones. I've been seeing you Facebooking, texting your friends, okay? So what I want you to do is if you think of a good question in the middle of the brief, I want you to text, text us. So you will type 90627 and your question, and then send it to 22333, okay? And then your question will pop up on the screen and at the Q&A session at the end, we'll address those questions. 
So maybe you're a little microphone shy, just text us your question, okay? So to kick things off, who wants to win a door prize? A little more excitement, guys. Okay, that's what I like to hear. Okay, for door prize number one. Get him out. <laughs> we have seven, three, four, six, six, one. <laughs> Do we have a winner? All right, come on up. Okay, one more. Thank you, Kim. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here and see a full house uh, today. Um, I started working here with the Weather Service in Newport. I've been with the Weather Service about 27 years now and came here in 03, right before Hurricane Isabel impacted the area. It was a Category 2 hurricane, but very impacting across the area. Not necessarily uh, in this immediate area, but there were there was some storm surge along the Noose and Pamlico rivers and as much as 10 feet Adams Creek. So and about every year I've been here, we've had some impact uh, from a tropical cyclone one way or another where it was whether it was a depression, a storm or a hurricane. We're a very vulnerable uh, area here in eastern North Carolina. I would say one of the most vulnerable in the whole country. Uh, you think about South Florida, you think about the middle Gulf Coast and you think about eastern North Carolina. And a major hurricane, a category three or higher, uh, is a rare event. Uh, so not many places in the U.S. Uh, have major hurricanes. And we haven't had a major hurricane on the U.S. coast since 05. It's been that long. As active as we've been, it's been 2005 since we had a major hurricane. That was Hurricane Wilma that struck southwest Florida and moved across uh, south Florida that year. So this year, we're not anticipating a really active hurricane season. I'll go into more uh, details about that, <clears throat> but we really can't let our guard down, as you know. Uh, it only takes one uh, hurricane, and not necessarily a major hurricane, to have a big impact uh, in the area. So what I'm going to talk about today are some of the changes uh, from the National Hurricane Center uh, for the upcoming season. And in the slide you see there, uh, Dan Brown, is it on yet? Okay, uh, Dan Brown is uh, one of the people, uh, warning coordination meteorologist from the National Hurricane Center uh, that put this presentation together. So uh, I was just recently at a WCM uh, warning coordination meteorologist uh, seminar uh, up in DC area and I was able to talk to him about uh, one of the products that will be coming out this year as well. So. I'm going to talk about changes for this year and some potential changes and um, updates uh, for the years to come as well. So it's pretty exciting uh, some of the things that are going on, especially with storm surge uh, here in the United States and with the National Hurricane Center. So <clears throat> the next slide uh, shows the 2014 uh, product changes and uh, really that says potential storm surge flooding map here. but. Uh, that is going to be in effect this year. And there are a couple of examples uh, here on the upper right and lower right. Uh, well, on the upper right, you see a storm surge inundation graphic uh, for the west coast of Florida. So it's just an example uh, there. And <clears throat> also, we're going to have a new uh, graphical five-day tropical weather outlook. Uh, so that's going to be uh, different this year. Changes to the 48-hour 
uh, graphical tropical weather outlook. That hasn't been in place yet, but it'll probably be in place uh, about the heart of the hurricane season. Uh, elimination of the maximum intensity table. Uh, that was really confusing, especially when storms made landfall because they weakened. Uh, so there was uh, some misinformation at the time of landfall that it was much weaker storm. So they're eliminating that. And they're also going to mix case text in the tropical weather outlook and the tropical cyclone discussion. They've already done that. Uh, much easier to read and you can also click on the links without having to convert uh, back. Uh, so the next slide is the storm surge inundation graphic <clears throat> and just to explain a little bit about that. Here are two examples, uh, one from the west coast of Florida and one from the southeast Texas area, uh, Galveston, Houston area. But basically what these are showing are storm surge inundation above ground level uh, from zero to three feet, three to six feet, and they're color coded uh, six to nine feet and 12 feet or above. Uh, so that's what the Hurricane Center has really gone to in the National Weather Service instead of mentioning mean sea level references. Uh, we're trying to tell people how deep that water is going to be, how high is that water uh, in a particular area. And that will only be refined uh, in the future. So this graphic will be generated uh, during the advisories uh, for a hurricane watch uh, or a warning 48 hours out, 36 hours out. And what it shows is worst case scenario. Uh, and it's based on uh, something we have, a, a surge model called SLOSH, Sea uh, Lake Overland Surge for Hurricanes model, uh, but it's also based on probabilistic surge. So uh, what you see here is 10% exceeded, so there's only a 10% chance that that inundation is going to be exceeded. So we consider that a worst case scenario for the category of hurricane uh, that is making landfall. So it would be a Cat 1 through a Cat 5. And it's going to take it a little time because of processing about 45 to 60 minutes after the advisory in order to get this information out. And one thing I was talking to Dan Brown about recently in D.C. Uh, was the fact that we needed these inundation graphics uh, for public outreach. And they are planning on doing this for the various parts of the country that are subject to storm surge inundation. And that will be available for the worst case scenarios for Cat 1 through Cat 5 hurricanes. So we'll see the areas uh, that are vulnerable to storm surge inundation and the levels uh, based on the categories of hurricane, worst case scenario. Uh, the next slide shows uh, the gra graphical tropical weather outlook. And uh, there are going to be changes to the 48 hour graphical tropical weather outlook and then extension to five days as well. So, in the tropical weather outlook uh, discussions, uh, they're going to have, uh, you know, the discussion and then the information about each uh, disturbance below that. But it's going to be a little bit different uh, in the way it's displayed. And you can see there it's marked by an X and also gives you some idea where the formation area is, uh, like the cone graphic uh, that we have, the cone of uncertainty with a hurricane. So it gives you some idea of where that disturbance is actually moving uh, as well. So in a case where there, there are overlapping areas, uh, there's going to be a mouse over capability where you can look at each individual uh, disturbance and get that information so it won't be so confusing. Uh, but in this case, uh, I don't think that's really changed. You have a low probability of development, uh, which is uh, less than 30% or less, and then 30 to 50 for a medium, above 50% probability of development uh, for high probability, and that's going to be color coded as well in orange and red. Uh, some of the future uh, potential NHC products um, are going to be in 2015 very likely a storm surge warning, a standalone product uh, for a storm surge warning. Of all the effects from a hurricane, we have many. Storm surge probably has the capability of taking more lives. So we want to highlight uh, that warning or watch product uh, with the storm surge warning, and that should be available in 2015. Um, but uh, that remains to be seen, but hopefully we'll have that product as well, a standalone product aside from the National Hurricane Center advisories, hurricane watches, or warnings. And <clears throat> one exciting thing too is right now, uh, the tropical cyclone forecasts go out to five days, and within probably two or three years, they'll have the skill to extend that time out to seven days. And for 
uh, emergency responders and planners. Uh, I think extending that forecast out to seven days is very important for them. Also, track and intensity forecast for disturbances. That's something new that Hurricane Center is considering as well. And <clears throat> really exciting to me is tropical storm and or hurricane watches and warnings uh, before tropical cyclone formation. And I think that can be extremely helpful to us here on the North Carolina coast when we have a disturbance maybe indicated, maybe not even showing up much, but the models are really spinning something up within 48 hours and making landfall here on our coastline. And I can think of one incident that occurred. It was back in 04. It was Hurricane Alex, the first storm of the season. <clears throat> and this storm was just off our coastline, off the South Carolina, North Carolina coast, a weak tropical storm. And it spun up very quickly to a Category 2 hurricane. Uh, barely enough time. Hurricane Center didn't have a warning out with only 18 hours of lead time and it came very close to Ocracoke and the Outer Banks and Dare County and only about 10 or 15 miles away and over 100 mile per hour winds. We had an eight foot storm surge inundation from the sounds. Uh, didn't give enough time for the people to get off Ocracoke. So there were hundreds of cars uh, that were stranded there, were flooded and even homes burning up from the electrical uh, systems um, being in, um, impacted by the salt water. Uh, so it's very impacting. So if we can get that watch and warning out uh, with, you know, ahead of that storm even uh, developing, uh, I think that's going to be a, a, real, a real help to uh, people here in North Carolina and other parts of the coast as well. Uh, I want to, uh, like, change gears here just for a little bit and talk about the Hurricane Hazel uh, anniversary. It's coming up October 15th this year, the 60th anniversary. So we're, our offices, uh, the WFO here at Newport, Moorhead City, and also down in Wilmington have uh, joined together uh, to commemorate this hurricane. Uh, we're holding a lot of town halls like this and, and seminars uh, to let people know uh, what an impact from a major hurricane can be. And this uh, was the last or the only Category 4 hurricane to make landfall here in eastern North Carolina in recorded history. It doesn't mean that hasn't happened before, and it doesn't mean we haven't had a Category 5 landfall uh, here in eastern North Carolina uh, in past history. Just uh, documented ones. Uh, this was the only one in 1954. <clears throat> Very unusual, too, to have one in mid-October of that magnitude. But it made landfall uh, down on the South Carolina, North Carolina border, moving very rapidly, didn't have a chance to really diminish in strength as it was moving up into the area, but it had big impacts up here as well. So uh, what if, what if that Category 4 hurricane had hit up here? It would have caused a lot of damage, a lot of storm surge. And the thing about a Category 4 hurricane compared to a Cat 1, uh, the wind speeds. Look at winds from a Category 1 hurricane, 75 mile per hour hurricane. Compare it to a Category 4, 150 mile per hour hurricane, you would think, well, the winds are going to be twice as powerful. Well, that's not true. Uh, the wind force exerted upon a flat surface uh, is actually a geometrical measure. So it, it's actually four times as strong. So 150 mile per hour wind exerts four times as much pressure force as a 75 mile per hour wind. Looking at 50 compared to 150, nine times more than a 50 mile per hour wind. So, and like I said earlier, we have a lot of different threats from hurricanes. Uh, the winds, the surge, inland flooding from hurricanes as well. And uh, we also have tornadoes, uh, which we saw with Hurricane Irene in 2011. And it doesn't take a major hurricane to cause a major storm surge. And we saw that with Hurricane Irene, a Category 1 hurricane uh, here in 2011. Storm surge damage right here at Cherry Point. Um, uh, down at Navy Docks, and we had a 10-foot surge in some areas from a Category 1 hurricane. Uh, these are the surface charts from Hurricane Hazel, and I grabbed this from uh, the report, uh, NOAA report that was put out after Hurricane Hazel in 1954, a very intense hurricane that moved up here. And, you know, back then, they just didn't have a whole lot to look at. It was pretty amazing. And you look at the technological advances since Hurricane Hazel, and we didn't have, we had radiosons, okay? We had aircraft recon, military. Uh, we had ship and band land-based reports. Uh, we did not have satellite. That didn't occur until 1960. We had no radar to, to track these storms. 
and we had no surge models. So I don't know how the hurricane forecasters uh, actually did this with Hurricane Hazel, but they did a pretty good job overall. Here's some of the damage pictures uh, in our area from Hurricane Hazel. Uh, this is surge damage in Swansboro. Now remember, this hurricane came on shore. We were in the right front quadrant, but it came on shore down at the South North Carolina border, so very far to the south, and very significant storm surge. We don't know the exact values up here, but I wouldn't be surprised if we had eight foot storm surge. Where it made landfall, South Point, in those areas down there, 18 foot storm surge uh, down there with Hurricane Hazel, 150 mile per hour winds. Uh, here's uh, Hazel at Moorhead City, and some of the surge as it was occurring. Again, that hurricane very far down the coast caused this much storm surge damage. Uh, here's the storm surge damage in Beaufort, uh, showing the roads that were undermined uh, by the storm surge there. 80 mile per hour plus winds recorded in Moorhead City and Beaufort. So what if? Uh, this is from our slosh model. And what I've done here is show worst case scenario category four hurricane and what the storm surge can be in our area. And you look at this graphic, this is the land areas actually subtracted. So this is above ground level inundation. And what you see here for our Pamlico River Basin along the coast, about a 20 foot surge uh, above ground level inundation could be expected from worst case cat four. And look along the rivers and the upper reaches of the Noose and Pamlico rivers, easily 10 to 15, uh, maybe in excess of that uh, storm surge inundation above ground level. So very significant if we had a major hurricane up in this area. Now, to go to the hurricane season forecast here, uh, I know many of you have seen the forecast and NOAA puts their forecast out in August, or uh, rather the start of the hurricane season, then updates in August. Uh, and we have ranges. Uh, this is issued by the, uh, the Prediction Center up in Washington, DC. And they've gone for eight to 13 named storms. Uh, hurricanes, three to six hurricanes, and one to two major hurricanes with sustained winds over 110 miles an hour. I guess the good thing about this is uh, there's a 90% chance of there being a below normal to near normal hurricane season this year. So a lot less than what we've expected or what we've had in the past, recent past. So the next slide shows some of the factors that are uh, preventing uh, maybe a, a high frequency hurricane season. And we don't have that African easterly jet that generates the lows uh, that are going to be, <clears throat> it's going to be as favorable. Uh, we're looking for near normal to below normal uh, sea surface temperatures in the mean development region in the Atlantic hurricane basin, uh, near or above average wind shear in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere, which would knock the tops off those thunderstorms as well. And also uh, much stronger trade winds at the surface, which would generate upwelling and also the uh, much below normal sea surface temperatures. So we're expecting El Nino to develop in the Eastern Pacific and the Nino 3-4 region. And this is a graph showing that uh, it's going to be climbing above a half a degree Celsius uh, during the heart of the hurricane season. And all the models are indicating that. We don't know how strong it's going to get. Uh, it could be uh, maybe a weak El Nino, and it may not cut down the numbers of storms as much. And it could be a strong El Nino or a moderate El Nino, which it would. So some of the models uh, that you see here um, indicate uh, from the climate forecast system at the Climate Prediction Center indicate uh, for a low resolution model, a stronger El Nino and a much quicker starting El Nino, water temperature is still at or below normal. And the high resolution model shows that maybe El Nino developing later and it not being as strong uh, this year. But both models are showing El Nino developing, which uh, should cut down on the numbers. Uh, these are the major hurricanes in, uh, in the 1990s. And I want to point out two hurricanes in particular. It wasn't a high frequency decade for hurricanes at all. One is Andrew in 1992. It was a Category 5 hurricane that devastated South Florida, then went on to hit Louisiana as a Category 3 hurricane. And in 1993, we had Hurricane Emily, a major hurricane, Category 3, that brushed the Outer Banks with a, over a 10-foot storm surge inundation from the sounds and 125 mile per hour winds. 
So during these years, 1992, we only had seven named storms that year, low frequency year. In 1993, we only had eight named storms, a low frequency year. So it only takes one storm. It doesn't matter how active the hurricane season is going to be, we have to be ready every year. It only takes one hurricane, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a major hurricane. Andrew accounted for $25 billion in damages uh, in Florida and Louisiana and 26 deaths, and Emily was very significant along the Outer Banks, a major Category 3 hurricane. I want to show you our web page real quick, and this is a part of our web page. But there's a lot of great information that you can go to and, and get uh, radar. We have satellite. Uh, we have river information as well uh, from the River Forecast Center. But if you look down to the lower left, uh, you'll see the hazardous weather briefing page. When we do have a significant event like a tropical system or a, a really significant severe weather system, winter weather, we're going to issue a PowerPoint briefing, which we send out to our emergency responders, which is available on our website as well consolidating all of the information and the hazards associated uh, with that weather event. So I would really recommend you go to our page and we're going to have a county-based impact graphic as well, web page that you're going to have access to as well, that you can look at the storm surge, you can look at the rainfall impacts, you can look at the wind impacts for each individual county. So we're really going to try and fine tune that information and put it in this hazardous weather briefing and other uh, briefing tools that we have as well. And there's also a tropical um, section here as well where you can go directly to Hurricane Center and get a lot of safety information there as well. So the final slide, I just want to show you some contact information here. Here's my contact um, and then Rich Bandy's contact. He's the meteorologist in charge at the weather office here. Uh, there's our number uh, for the forecast office. You can go directly uh, to the operations area by hitting five. Now, here are some of the references that you might find useful as well. Uh, Moorhead City, Facebook, we have Twitter, uh, National Hurricane Center website, and uh, from the Hydro Meteorological Prediction Center, uh, rainfall estimates as well. So we gain, get a lot of information uh, from the national centers uh, as well. So, if you have any questions, uh, if we are threatened by a tropical system or any other weather system, you're more than welcome to call the Weather Service and talk to uh, me or one of our operational forecasters. And, uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cole. That was wonderful information. All right, who's ready for another door prize? Okay, do we have anybody who came in a little late? I need your ticket stubs. Okay, we'll catch you on the next round. Okay, number seven, three, four, seven, zero, two. All right. All right, we're going to move on to our next presenter for the afternoon. I'd like to introduce you to Major James Jarvis, retired USMC. He is here with us from the American Red Cross. Uh, to volunteer 
uh, when you get an opportunity, be it with the Red Cross or be it with any other organization. Now, who can tell me what does the Red Cross do, generally speaking? Okay, all right, so emergency, uh, emergency communication. Uh, any of us that's ever been on duty knows when you get a Red Cross message in the middle of the night, uh, that that's obviously a very high priority. And hopefully sometimes it's good news back home, like the birth of a baby or something like that. Other times, you know, they're requesting the presence because a family member is, uh, you know, not being on death's door per se. So obviously emergency communication is one thing. What are some other things? Disaster relief, uh, a lot of times we have pre-positioned assets uh, all, all across the country, so when the time comes, we respond very quickly, get out there and do a preliminary damage assessment, get a sense for how big the scope of the problem is going to be, and then get our assets and field as quickly as possible to help alleviate suffering. Like any good brief, we have a mission statement, just like anyone else. Um, we want to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies. We do that through the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. The American Red Cross is roughly 94% volunteers and only 6% uh, permanent personnel. And so we're very reliant on volunteers uh, and coordinating all of those efforts to get out into the communities to help immediately following a disaster. Obviously, we also do blood services. Uh, many of you, especially if you have O negative blood like me, you get called a lot because they love uh, universal donors. They love coming to help me with needles. All right, who can tell me what this uh, hurricane is? Emily. Emily? Lizzie. Fran? No, that's Hurricane Floyd in 1999. It was a Category 4 storm as it approached uh, the United States. And by the time it actually came ashore, it was about a hurricane, or it was about a Category 2. And that little star, if we were able to zoom in on it, you can see Lance Wolf Bolt that. She's sitting right about there. All right. So why do we prepare? Why do you prepare for storms? So you can leave quickly. Obviously, there aren't that many ways out of eastern North Carolina, be it uh, Highway 17 or Highway 70. For any of you who have tried to get out of eastern North Carolina, especially on 96, you know this to be the case. So imagine if there is a large-scale evacuation like Hurricane Floyd that was the third largest evacuation in the history of the United States. They had 2.6 million residents that were ordered to evacuate from five states. So imagine the time you're going to be spending in your car if you're trying to evacuate during that particular time. All right, so some of these things, this is sort of a snapshot from last year as to what the prevailing attitudes were relative to uh, storms coming your way. As you see up in New York and New Jersey, they've gotten a little more of a Hurricane Sandy most recently. You know, they've gotten more of those who are concerned, more are taking steps to prepare. But by and large, uh, it's very similar to what uh, good old infamous Banat says during your safety briefs. It's the same things that uh, some of you might be saying now, it's not going to happen to me. So, as Mr. Cole said, oh, yes, it will. Yes, it is. It does certainly have the potential. So, here are some other stats for you to consider. Uh, one in three residents surveyed don't have an emergency kit. I'm going to talk to you about an emergency kit. NCCS is right here who can help you get an emergency kit since you're here. Um, one and two uh, don't have a plan for communicating with your family. I would imagine all of you probably have an emergency recall card. You have your commands card. You can reach your CO. You can reach your sergeant major. You can reach your chaplain. You can reach the command duty officer. All of you probably have an emergency wallet card. But does your family have one? Do your children, for example, have one of those little emergency laminated cards in their wallet or in their backpack? So they can reach you, they can reach grandma who lives out of state who happens to be your emergency coordination point. So those are the types of things. You do a lot of preparedness. My wife used to harass me all the time. She'd come to my office and I'm very well organized. I have charts and I have you know, detailed breakdown of how everything's going to happen. 
but yet I would leave laundry in the washing machine for like two days and have to rewash it again. So uh, you gotta carry some of that planning that you're so good at doing it at work, translate that back to the home so that you can help your family be prepared for these types of circumstances. All right, so one thing we'll say, get a kit, we're gonna talk about that kit. You wanna make a plan and you wanna be informed. So first thing, uh, when uh, Mr. Cole was talking about it, he was talking about some of the terminology, a hurricane watch and a hurricane warning. Uh, a watch within the next 48 hours, uh, you know, a hurricane is approaching. You want to take the steps necessary to respond to that, and then a warning is within 36 hours. And at that point, most likely, uh, they're going to be giving evacuation orders. And you don't want to have to wait until the last possible minute when the commander is going to give the order to evacuate. If you know it's coming, uh, you want to get ahead of that traffic jam if you can. All right. Okay, so some of the things, when you take a look at the kit, uh, uh, kit what are some things you think might want to be in your emergency kit? Water. Water, not how much water. One gallon per person per day. So you want to think you're probably going to have to go the first three days on your own, alone and unafraid. So it's probably going to take that long for emergency responders to uh, wrap their head around the problem and start getting into your community. So you got to expect you're going to need water, you're going to need some food that's uh, not perishable. So what are some other things you're going to want an emergency to get? Flashlight with batteries. First aid kit. Okay, first aid kit. What are some other things? Gloves. Clothes. Radio. You're going to want to have a radio. Clothes. Uh, you're going to have your clothes there. So generally speaking, you don't need to grab it and go. You're pretty much going to have what you are. You're probably not going to run out of the house naked. But, but a good idea to plan extra skivvies. Um, all right. Here are some things I know it's a little hard to read. Uh, you got water, food. One thing to keep in mind, power is going to go out. More often than not, power is gonna go out. So one thing you can do to help keep your food in your fridge a little longer, you can take, when you know power is gonna go out, wouldn't put, uh, empty your ice tray, put the ice in Ziploc bags, and put that in your vegetable trays in the bottom of your refrigerator. And that will actually help keep your refrigerator cooler. Make sure you keep the door closed, but that might give you a better chance of saving some of that chow that you got in your uh, fridge. So power's gonna go out, extra cash. ATMs are probably not gonna work. So in a lot of places you go, if the power's out, the power's out along the evacuation route, it's out in other places. And so you might not have the ability to just <laughs> run it on your debit card or run it on your credit card like you would expect. So it's a good idea, uh, if possible, to take out some cash so you have that in anticipation of a power outage. Emergency blanket, maps the area, uh, cell phones, chargers, your, your uh, important documents, so that way in case your home gets hit by either uh, winds or storm surge, you don't want to lose birth certificates, marriage licenses, etc. All right, so you've got your kit. You've got your uh, to-go bag, hopefully you have clothes, and then you want to make a plan. Now what are some of the things that they say uh, about plans, generally? What? Well, have a backup plan, but the best plans are those that are communicated. So you can have a great plan that you've written, and you put it on a shelf at home, but if nobody knows about it, if your family doesn't know about it, if your Marines don't know about it, then the plan is only as good as the paper it's written on. So make a plan. Uh, what are some of the things you might want to do for a plan with respect to your family readiness? Where to meet? So you want to know where to meet. You want to know uh, where are we going if we have to evacuate. Uh, you don't want to evacuate into a place, like you wouldn't want to evacuate from Cherry Point and go to Charleston, for example. I mean, yes, there's great chow down there, but no, you're probably still in the path of the hurricane. So you're going to want to go far inland 
so that you're not creating, you're going into an area that's just as vulnerable as the place you're leaving. So you're going to want to pick a place. You're going to want to make sure that you have a central point of contact, somebody, be it grandma or somebody else that you're coordinating with. So that way everybody knows if we can't communicate with each other, because the cell phone, cell towers, and now what the case may be, we have somebody that we can reach out and touch. So you want to avoid chaos by planning, communicating, and practicing your plan. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you want to stay informed. When you fall off the electrical grid, you know, your cell phones might work and they might run out of power, so you want to make sure that you have those emergency cards that I mentioned earlier, you have a point of contact out of state or out of town who you are giving routine updates to uh, so that you can keep up with what's happening. You want to have a weather radio that's not reliant on, uh, not reliant upon the power staying on so that you can keep up to date with what this man right here is telling you about what the storm is doing. All right. All right, and you don't want to leave anyone behind. Just as Sergeant Chesky here wouldn't leave PFC's butler behind, you don't want to leave your pets behind. So pets, what are some things you want to consider with respect to Sparky or Fluffy? Hotels that accept dogs, right? You want to have, have an idea along my evacuation path. I appreciate you having the severe weather, sir. Um, but yes, pets, you want to know along the way what pets are or what hotels are pet friendly. What are some other things? What? Food, you want to bring some chow, our at home. We have a bearded dragon. Lizard is about 22 inches long. So I don't know if we're going to pack some crickets for him. He might have to go on a more of a vegetarian diet uh, during an evacuation which he won't be exactly happy with. But yes, you want to plan for your pets, you want to have their food, you want to have any pertinent information. If you cannot evacuate with them, if we set up a shelter, if the Red Cross sets up a shelter, unfortunately your pets can't come with you to said name shelter. And so you want to have a backup plan as to what you're going to do with Fluffy or Sparky. <coughs> we have some information sheets back there that you'll be able to get as to some other suggestions on what you can do to take care of your pets. We also have a hurricane app. So we are also in the uh, 21st century, so it's both Android and iPhone compatible. And there's our local contact information. And I wanted to share with you this before I, I close here. So when I was deployed to Afghanistan in 2001 and 2002, uh, I ran across a young Marine sergeant who carried a block of wood with him everywhere he went. It had a little, it had a, a cord on it, and he sort of carried it, you know, sling arms, so in case may be. And he was a combat engineer, and he was building us frivolous things like, you know, toilets, and places to shave, and that sort of thing. But he carried it with him throughout the entire deployment. I thought it was just like a field expedient ruler or something like that. And come to find out, I sat down and shared an MRE with him. Come to find out, right before we deployed, his son was born. And this was the exact length of what his son was before we deployed. So we carried this with him the entire nine-month deployment to remind him what was important. Why he was there. Why he was doing what he did. And so I would encourage all of you to remember what's important in terms of taking care of your families, Preparing for these, taking care of your young Marines, so that uh, you, know, you don't necessarily have to carry a block of wood the size of your Marines. That'd be a big old piece of wood. But just remember what's important and do the right thing. Here's your local contact information for the Red Cross, and thank you very much. Have fun.
Mr. Michael McGinnis. He is the MAG 14 Family Readiness Officer and he'll be sharing some information regarding family readiness. Good afternoon. Was anybody here last year? We tried the circus song last year because I looked out and I seen some of the Marines sleeping. Everybody was tired, and so I said, let's do the circus song, and it didn't go over well. Do we want to try it this year? No? Yeah. Uh, yes? All right, so that half of the room, that half of that half over there, when I say three, and I want you to maintain it, I just want you to go oompa pa oompa pa oompa pa That second half of the room, I want you to go ching, 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 and maintain it. This half of this half, you're going to go dun 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 and maintain it. And this group goes dun 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 And when we mix it all up, it sounds like a circus came. So let's just give it a shot. All right, give it a shot. All right, when I say three, you have to maintain it. If you're an oompa it's important. It's no less important than these people over here. We're all a portion of the train. One, two, three. Dun dun. Nice. Great. Thank you. <laughs> we tried. It was better than last year's. I had, to, I had to follow James and John here, and so they're really elegant speakers, so I had to do something to sort of liven it up, right? Um, first, to start off, two of the four main tenets of the Family Readiness Program, two of them are information resource referrals and communications. And what's more important to communicate when we're in times of need or we have a natural disaster staring on our coast, right? So that's where family readiness falls in. Um, the thing that's really important for everybody here, and this is going to be the quickest speech you have this afternoon, is that um, every unit is very specific. Every commanding officer, every command team has something that they want to do. I'll share a story. I worked for a gentleman named Lieutenant Colonel uh, Williams. And when we had Hurricane Irene three years ago, I believe it was, um, I was sitting in my house, and you think I'm teasing you, and I had one of them little headlamps on, and I had markers, and he was stressing me out, and he's like, where's the spouses in Charlotte? And I'm like, sir, they're here, and he's giving me barometric pressures, and it was just insane. We had so many people and so many moving parts, and he sent contact teams out to the families, and he made sure the swimming pools were tied down and everything else. But every unit's very specific on what they do and what they expect with family readiness. Um, and Lieutenant Colonel Williams, that for that whole hurricane, he wore me out. The next week I came in, I was like, sir, you're killing me. Um, some of the things that we use to communicate effectively, we all know is the E-Marine. Some of our units have the 1-800 numbers. Um, some units may not have a active duty, or excuse me, a civilian fro, but every unit's required to have a active duty fro or a deputy fro. So you want to make sure you know who that is, if, if, if possible. Um, and also, if you're a deployed spouse, a lot of our Marines here at Cherry Point, at times they get assigned to Muse and then they end up at the VMM down there at uh, New River Air Station, or you go out on an IA billet or a TAD billet, um, there's still a FRO that has coverage to provide the information resource for and communications for you as well. And the last thing I will talk to you about is have a great day. Thank you. Single Marines, that oompa pa song, I swear to you, it'll work. If you're in an elevator and you want to meet a young lady or a young man, try to get everybody on the elevator to do that, and they'll do it. I promise. Thank you, Mr. Mike McGinnis. Okay, girl prize time. Getting ready. 734606. All right, come on down. All right, moving on to our next presenter. We have Sergeant Urban from um, Me Talk here to join us today. Thank you. Thank you. Has anyone here ever heard of MeTalk before? Yeah. Okay, cool. Some of you guys get the phone calls or the warnings and advisories. They get pretty annoying at times, I understand. Uh, but they are important. We take our job very serious, and we are here for you. Uh, as you can see on the, is it up? 
On the first slide here, we have our mission. Our mission here is to provide meteorological and oceanographic forecasting support to tenant commands, transient air crew, and personnel aboard the designated installations. We are the regional METOC center, so we are in charge of Quantico, Camp Pendleton, Cherry Point, and Buford as long as uh, Paris Island. Um, so get, getting into what we do here, well first, where we're located. We're in building 199, uh, it's the base of the tower. So if you head in the Slocum Gate, uh, remain straight through the intersection all the way down to the dead end, make a left, that's Gate 9. Uh, that is where we, we are located for the Marines if you have flight line access. Uh, for the civilians, you can reach us, um, basically just, you can, you can call us at our office. It's 252-466-2523. Uh, if you want to take that down, we're here, we're here to help for any, uh, any of your hurricane needs this year. Um, that's where we're located. Here for the Marines, we have our PKI website. It's a four-day forecast that we put together uh, every day, and we keep those up to date. So you can go to pki.weather.navy.mil. We'll put any of our hurricane warnings on there as well, as long as the four-day forecast. There's some of uh, our phone number there if you didn't get a chance to write it down, 466-2523. For civilians, cherrypoint.marines.mil is where you'll find the 2014 guide. It's also in the back with public affairs. Uh, they brought it in for you to take it home. It's going to have any of our tropical storm conditions in there. Uh, so when you're getting these warnings and when you're calling that hotline right there, 466-3093, you'll understand what those warnings are and which tropical cyclone condition we are in at the, at the current time. This is basically just saying how the warnings and advisories go out. Uh, this is mainly for the enlisted ones here. Your commands will get an email, or if you're on our distribution list, you'll get the phone call. And if you want to get on that phone call list, get with me after this, and I'll put you on it. Tropical Cyclone Condition 5. We are currently in Tropical Cyclone Condition 5. Uh, no sweat. Uh, 1 June to 30 November, we will remain in this Tropical Cyclone Condition. Uh, tropical Cyclone Condition 4 is destructive winds of 50 knots or greater, anticipated within 72 hours. So moving to 3 is 48 hours, 2 is 24 hours, and 1 uh, we're expecting within 12 hours. We also have the caution, emergency, and recovery. So caution, uh, hopefully you will be evacuated at this time, um, but those are going to go out within six hours of those destructive winds and the precip uh, precipitation uh, amounts of three inches or more within an hour. Uh, emergency means that we are currently undergoing those conditions, the winds and the precip. And recovery means that the tropical cyclone threat has moved off, but we are still experiencing some stronger winds and uh, possibly still a storm surge. So we'll, we'll send out the all clear uh, once those conditions have stopped. This is just kind of a sneak peek uh, behind the scenes what we do. Uh, we'll get on a conference call with National Weather Service as well as the National Hurricane Center and they're going to give us a rundown on what's going on and we'll put together a brief and we send these briefs right here up to um, all the commanders and all the squadron level stuff as well as uh, Miss. Uh, Edo over there at the EOC. So just kind of a rundown what it is, current satellite shot and the Latin long and where it's forecasted to go. We'll put the installation impacts. We are the regional METOC center so it will be all the installations that uh, that fall under us. And, uh, just the winds and the precipitation that they will expect. And lastly we'll put out a, a brief with the how far away the tropical cyclone is, so you have a better estimation on how long you have to, to evacuate. And then this brief will go to, like I said, the ELC where we'll brief it daily, sometimes multiple times a day while we're actually experiencing these conditions. And they will be the ones to make the call whether or not we're going to evacuate, whether we're going to hang the aircraft, or we're going to you know, take the aircraft out of here before uh, you know, these winds and storm surge is going to affect our installation. But other than that, that's all I have. I appreciate it. Thank you, Sergeant Urban, for joining us today. Okay, before our next speaker, get your tickets out. A couple more door prizes.
Seven, three, four, six, nine, eight. Six, nine, eight. All right. All right, I'd like to turn it over to Miss Etta Lucas. She's the Cherry Point Installation Emergency Manager. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank y'all for coming. Thank you for taking time out to learn all this information. It's my position and responsibility to make sure that you are informed and know how to respond to any event, and not just a hurricane, not severe weather, but we work on all hazards um, in our office. I work out of mission assurance through operations, and we work directly for the commanding officer, and he wants to make sure that his installation is safe and secure. So that is my job and to inform you of any information that we receive in the Emergency Operations Center. We, re we receive weather service information. We receive METOC. Together we put all this information. We collaborate with all our agencies with, and directorates, tenant commands, to make sure everybody on this installation, whether you work here, live here, or just transient through, that you have the same information. Who has not been through a hurricane? Okay. Well, you're in for a real treat if you have to go through one. Um, but we're going to try and make sure that you're safe. Who has a plan? Well, I see a couple of hands. But after today, you've learned a lot from Red Cross and your froze um, to have that plan, whether it's communications plan, whether it's a kit. Um, just have a plan. Be prepared. That's, that's the best way to be safe. Some of my talking points are going to be notifications. How are you going to get notifications? Well, we have a good service here. We have public affairs, and they put it on the website. They send it out social media, Google+. Plus. We have it local TV, Channel 6. We have our local TV stations, radio stations. So there's many means of um, way, ways of getting that information. We're also going to talk about safety and evacuations. In the past, we have been a shelter-in-place installation. We're looking at our own plan here. So before you make any plans to evacuate, you need to make sure that that's what the installation's doing, what your command's doing. And we're going to be working with the other directorates on that. Shelters um, on base and off base, we're going to talk about that, and a recovery plan. Disasters, they are unpredictable. They don't happen just in the daytime, they don't happen at night. And I don't know if you can see this very well, but we have lightning, we have lightning strikes a lot. METOC's always sending out the lightning strike information. Um, earthquakes, you may not think you have an earthquake around here, but um, I receive um, notifications several times a month about earthquakes. We're right on the fault line. I believe it's in Charleston. Um, fires, we have fires. Our fire department does a great job here um, of suppressing these. We also um, are prepared for terrorism um, and tornadoes. We have had some tornadoes hit in the past. Some, some common misconceptions. It won't happen here. Well, let me tell you, it will. During Hurricane Irene, we had just set up the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, and as we were setting it up, getting prepared, the previous slide showed earthquake. the earthquake that occurred in Richmond. We felt building one tremble, and we just turned and looked at each other. So you can have the effects of an earthquake here. So it will happen here. It won't affect me. Well, as someone said earlier, we do have power outages. Even though we have a lot of generators on this installation, you may live in town or at your homes that you don't have barracks. Um, I understand our barracks do not have generators. So you, you, if you, who lives in the barracks? Okay, well y'all need to really be prepared. Make sure that you have your plans. Make sure you have those cell phones charged. They're selling um, chargers over here, so I, I advise you to make sure they're charged so you can get all this information. Because once we go into tropical cyclone condition 1E, 
you will not be able to go outside on this installation until it's announced all clear. Let me say that again. TCC 1E, no one is to be moving around the base. We don't even let our first responders out during that time um, unless the CO or the senior watch officer determines that it's safe for them to go out at that time. So there will be no movement on the installation until an all clear is announced. I cannot specify that enough. Um, we've had that issue happen in the past. Most, <clears throat> most emergencies are short-lived. Well, I want to tell you, during Hurricane Irene, my personal home in Newburn was without power for eight days. So it can happen here. So that's why we tell you to be prepared. Make sure you have that food, that water, whatever the supplies you need. Um, you may not want to eat MREs the entire time. So make sure you have those snacks and you're prepared. Preparing takes too much time. It doesn't. If you have children, who has children? Take the children with you to the store. Make it fun. Take that checklist. And we have some on our table, some checklist for you. Make, it, make an, it a fun event for them. These are some of our warnings and notification systems that we have. We have dispatch, 911 center. If you have an emergency, that's the number you call on this installation. If you have a cell phone and call 911 from your cell phone, it's not gonna ring directly to this 911 center on the installation. It's gonna go off to another 911 center and they're gonna transfer it back. So if you do call, make sure that from a cell phone, make sure you let them know where you're calling from, what location. That's very important for them. Some of the other systems, we have the giant voice throughout the installation so that if we have to send a, information out that we can send that out on the giant voice and you'll hear that if you're outside at any of these outside structures. MeTalk, we have MeTalk that sends information out on the weather here. We, actually, we have NOAA, we have a weather radio, we have a weather radio in our emergency operations center. Ad hoc is our newest system on the installation and that's our mass notification system that some of you may have already gotten. If you have a dot mil address, then I advise you to go in and list your information. You can list your spouse's information so that they can get notifications. Um, the most recent one was right after the air show, the next day we had a fire on the installation and we sent out the notification. So that is another one of our systems we have here on, on the installation. We are a storm ready installation, which means that we have means to receive alerts from National Weather Service, METOC. We have numerous ways of receiving this information and numerous ways of sending that information out. Safety precautions and preparedness. The, the easiest way for us to be um, safe is to be prepared. Have that kit. Have a plan. It increases your survivability. Um, Stay informed, and we are gonna keep you informed. As long as we have information, you're gonna have the information. We're gonna share that with each and every one of you. So please make sure that you, it, during any event, like a weather event, make sure that you keep that radio or your cell phone tuned in. And there are a lot of apps. Red Cross has an app. Nash, uh, North Carolina Emergency Management now has an app that's available that also lists shelters, what shelters are open, what roads are available, what evacuation routes are available. In evacuations, make sure that you have transportation number one, make sure that you know where you're going if you have to evacuate. And we have some maps of the routes for North Carolina emergency management's come up with for evacuations. They also have a plan in North Carolina. And I've listed up here, DOT has a number you can call in for road closures. This is the North Carolina evacuation map. Most of our main roads, Highway 70, 17, 58, 101, they all blend together to try to get you to 95 where it's easier to access and get out of the state. And this is on our emergency preparedness guide and I have some on my table and I encourage you to take these as these have information on all hazards, anything that you might, it, that might incur. And it has emergency contact numbers that you can list, resources that are here and available, um, 
whether it's a suspicious mail package, bomb threat, lockdown, active shooter, I encourage you to take these. We have these available for you. Installation shelters. The Marine Dome is our pet friendly shelter. So if you have a pet and we ask that these are only domestic pets and that you bring their vac vaccination record with you, um, that's very important. You will also need to provide supplies for that pet. Make sure that you have kennel or a leash. And if you're gonna bring the pet to the shelter, make sure you stay um, with that pet. Our local and our other shelter is Cherry Tree House. Our local shelters, the pet friendly shelter is Bendy Quinn and that's on Highway 17 South, and then in Carter County, their uh, pet friendly is Newport Middle. Again, this is from our emergency preparedness guide. This information's in here on shelters, so if you want any additional information. And for disaster recovery, don't let this be your plan, help, help. Um, we are here to help, but we need your help also. We need you to make sure you have that plan and that you're as prepared as possible. So if you have any questions, um, I'm always available. And I am in Building 1 in the Mission Assurance Department and always available to help answer any questions. Um, the main thing for, that I want you to remember is that for your recovery, do not go outside away from your building or a shelter until you're told to. That's the, if you don't take anything else from here today, take that. And these are just some flooding events that, this was not even a hurricane, this was just a rain event that occurred. And I want you to look at these um, cars. And of course our fire department, our, there's our fire truck. And you can see how deep the water is. It doesn't take a lot of water to move a vehicle. It's only, pardon me? Six, six, six inches. So please don't go out and walk and I'm gonna, it wasn't in here, shucks. There was another picture of um, some gentleman walking. Thank you, that's all I have. Just make sure you pick up this information. Thank you, Miss Etta. All right, another door prize. Before our last speaker, let me pick a good one. Okay, seven, three, four. Seven, two, three. All right, big winner. You get two door prizes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, our last speaker this afternoon is Captain Palmer from our Legal Su Services Support Team. Thank you for being here. All right, I'm Captain Palmer. I run uh, Legal Assistance uh, over at the LSST. Um, some of y'all may know me as that guy who gives the really boring class to you before you deploy. Um, anyone here from Second Lad? <laughs> Well, I'll see you all tomorrow for a really boring pre-deployment class. <laughs> and uh, if you're a staff and or a warrant officer, you may know me as the guy who did your last divorce. <laughs> um, I also, uh, I can't hype the, uh, the importance of emergency kits enough because I checked into Cherry Point uh, the day before Irene made landfall. And I was a second lieutenant. I was eager to you know, make an impact on my Marines, but I was told to get my butt over to the BOQ and not leave until I was told. And I decided to stock my emergency kit with a quarter pound of uh, turkey lunch meat. And needless to say, as soon as the electricity went off, that didn't last very long. So uh, don't do that. Um, but in terms of legal, I'm here to talk about claims, um, how you can get money from the government for things that get broken during the hurricane. Now, you can't get money for everything. So we're going to talk about what you can get money for and how you can get, go about doing that. So what you want to know, it's the Military Personnel and Civilian Employees Act. Um, and that act authorizes compensation to Navy and Marine Corps military and civilians for any damage or loss caused, or not for any damage, some damage or loss caused by fire, explosion, theft, vandalism, lightning, flood, earthquake, or unusual occurrence if that damage or loss is incident to service. 
So that's the key there. It has to be incident to your service. Um, damage at off-base housing is pretty much never going to be incident to service because it's off-base. It's not incident to your service. But damage on-base housing might be. For example, a common one we see, we saw during Irene, was cars that were parked on the installation because somebody was here on station dealing with Irene and their car got damaged. That's, in, that's incident to your service. So who can, well, how, and how much can you get? The maximum you can get under law is $40,000, uh, or up to $100,000 in what's called extraordinary circumstances. But you're only going to get the amount to compensate you for your loss and the repairs that have to be made. You're not just going to get $40,000 for anything. It's only going to be the amount that you rate. Um, who can file? So they can be filed by, they can only be filed by the owner or lessee of the damaged property or their legal representative or someone with power of attorney for that person. Um, your bank cannot file on your behalf um, even if they have financed your vehicle, even if you financed your vehicle through them. Um, your insurance company cannot file a claim for you either. You have to do it or your legal representative. Um, and you have to be on active duty um, or a current civilian Department of the Navy employee in order to qualify. Um, reservists can qualify, but only if they were on active duty when the damage occurred. And you have to file within two years. So, where do you go to do it? Well, if a, disaster, if a disastrous weather occurrence happens, uh, there will be an investigation conducted. And if the outcome of that investigation is that a significant amount of claims are expected, we will stand up what's called a claim center. So the claim center is temporary. One doesn't exist now. As far as I know, the last one we had was the... Uh, 2011 uh, Chili Fest incident, and then before that, Hurricane Irene. Um, so those were two right next to each other, but there were claim centers set up for both of those. Um, so the best way to find out about the claim center um, is to call either of the two numbers up here on the PowerPoint. Those are the main numbers for the law center, and the Marines that answer that phone will certainly be able to tell you uh, where the claim center is and how to get in touch with them. What does the claims office do? Well, once it's set up, that's going to be your main POC. They're going to have copies of both DD form 1842 and DD form 1844. Those are the two forms that, are, that you use to file a claim. Uh, they will have general information about how to fill out the form and they can give you limited guidance on how to fill it out. They can't really hold your hand through the process too much because since we're all United States government employees, we're not allowed to represent you in any way in getting money from the government, but we can give you general guidance on how to fill out the forms and how to file your claim. Now, if you want to file the claim yourself, you don't want to go to the claim center for whatever reason, or you can't get to the claim center for whatever reason, or you have to make some sort of a claim and the government decided not to set up a claim center, then, you need to, then you're going to have to get on the internet. And you're going to have to look for something that's called Code 15. So if you Google uh, Navy JAG Code 15, their website will come up. Um, and what Code 15 is, is that's the Department of the Navy's claim center. And they have all the forms on there, as well as guidance on how to fill them out. So if there's no claim center, you're going to want to go there. If there is a claim center, it's probably easier just to go to the claim center. Before you submit your claim, you have to make sure that you tried to get money from your insurance company. So for example, if it's to your car, you have to have reached out to your car insurance company first, and they have to have denied you um, any sort of reimbursement before you can get money from the government. And then who determines whether you get the money? Well, it's something called the Personal Claims Unit. And they will investigate your claim, and they will decide whether or not you rate the money that you're asking for. Um, and they will then pay that money out to you if you, they do think you rate it. You can rate, again, money that you can be used to repairs, money that can be used for replacement if the, something is completely destroyed. And you can even get reimbursed for the amount of money that you needed to get an estimate on something. So for example, if you had to bring your car somewhere to find out how much it was going to cost to get fixed, and they charged you money to get that estimate, you can be reimbursed for the cost of that estimate as well. And then the claim will be paid by DFAS. So if you're currently paid by DFAS, um, it'll be direct deposited in your account. If you're not, they can cut you a check. Or on your claims form, you can put your bank account information, and they can drop it right in there for you automatically. Uh, the references for this, if anybody's interested, uh, the first one is uh, JAG instruction 5890.1 alpha. And that's basically the JAG instruction for the Department of the Navy governing the entire claims process. Uh, and then there's also the, what's commonly known as the JAG man. A lot of you are probably familiar with that. But if you look at chapter two, that talks about litigation reports, which is the type of investigation that's going to be done regarding your claim. Um, and chapter eight covers a lot of provisions regarding claims. There's also the uh, Personnel Claims Act, which is the uh, act of Congress that allows 
the government to pay you for your claim. And the site on that is 31 USC 3721. And if you Google that, it should come right up. Uh, if anybody needs to hear those again, uh, you can find me after, and I'll be happy to tell you about them. And then the other thing I want to talk about real quick is what legal assistance can do um, to help make sure you're prepared um, for any type of disaster. And the main things that we can help you with are insurance, and we can help you with powers of attorney. So if you're getting ready to go on deployment, um, you've probably been told a lot about the importance of a power of attorney. Well, where that factors into disastrous weather is if a hurricane hits while you're gone, and the insurance is in your name, and your spouse is left here with a tree that went through the middle of your house, and she wants to get insurance money so she can get your house fixed, and the insurance is your, in your name, the insurance company may not want to deal with her. But if you give her, we can give you a power of attorney at legal assistance that will allow her to deal with that, her or him. Um, so if you, come into, if you come into legal assistance, you can get a power of attorney, tell, them you want, tell us you want to make sure that they'll be able to deal with your insurance company, and we can set it up so that, that, so that they can do that. Um, the other thing we can do is insurance. We can help you with insurance claims because you're not seeking money from the U.S. government. So if you're struggling with how to claim money from your insurance company, come in and see us. If you're looking into getting an insurance policy, either homeowner, car insurance, and you want some help with that process, you want to know what the different policies mean, if this is an adequate policy for you, come in and see us and we can help you with that process as well. Um, additionally, we also have two notaries at the Law Center, so if you're making an insurance claim and you need to get documents notarized, you can come in and see us, and we can notarize all your documents for you. And uh, that's all I have. All right. Thank you to our wonderful panel of speakers today. Did you guys learn a lot of information? OK, who has some questions? We're going to open it up now, opening up the floor to our question and answer session. OK. Has anybody texted a question in? Do you guys utilize this? OK, we're going to open up the floor. Does anybody have any questions? Our panel is here. Don't be shy. Just stand up and ask your question. Nobody has a question? Sure. Very good. Any other questions? Sure. <laughs> Don't look to me. <laughs> Piano, please. Thank you for sharing. Any other questions? <laughs> Chili Fest. <laughs> I guess you'll have to Google it. OK. OK, we're going to turn it over to our text in a question. OK, there we go. What happened during the 2011 Chili Fest? <laughs> so we have that uh, answer for you from Captain Palmer. How about the next one? If I live in Beaufort and a hurricane hits, where do I take my family? And do I get to stay the duration of the storm? If they live in Beaufort, where are they recommended to take shelter?
Okay. Again, um, at the conclusion of this brief, please enjoy the wonderful vendors we have here today. They have um, worked very hard. These ladies came in the pouring rain to set up their table today for you. So please take advantage of all the resources in the room. I have one, two more prizes to give. Wouldn't that be amazing? Seven, three, four, six, five, three. but this time we're not doing a ticket, okay? So under someone's chair, there is a hurricane taped. If you are sitting on the hurricane, you have won the prize. And if you're not sitting on it, check the chair next to you. Without knocking over the chairs. It is taped to a secret chair. Found it. Winner, winner. <laughs> okay, again, thank you all for joining us today for our 2014 Hurricane Severe Weather Seminar. Uh, we hope you have learned something today. Um, we hope you will prepare, get your plans together, get your kits together. We will all be around to answer any questions you have. I see some spouses in the, in the room today. If you have a child at the CDC for hourly care or with a babysitter, you can be reimbursed today. So make sure you see Jessica at the front entrance. She has the CDC vouchers and reimbursement forms. And um, lastly, I do see some spouses in the room today. We are trying to take a spouse picture um, at this event. We are hoping this event today gets promoted on Miss Bonnie Amos's Facebook page. So spouses, we need every spouse available. If you're interested in this opportunity, we would love to take a picture with you with Mr. John Cole and Etta Lucas um, next to the tornado machine. So if you could stick around for that. We hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to talk to any one of us um, after this brief. Please visit, visit the tables. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>